राधा माधवा कुंज बिहारी जय गोपी श्रीमद भागवतम की शीला प्रभुपाद की जय नेताय गौर प्रेमानंदे ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय हरे कृष्णा टुडे वी आर रीडिंग फ्रॉम कैंटो सिक्स चैप्टर ट्वेल्व चैप्टर ट्वेल्व इज एंटाइटल्ड वृत्रासुरास ग्लोरियस डेथ टुडे वी आर ऑन टेक्स नाइनटीन इंद्र उवाच अहोदानव सिद्धोसी अहोदानव सिद्धोसी यतिरीद्रशील यतिरीद्रशी भक्त सर्वात्मनात्मा भक्त सर्वात्मना सूरद जगदीश्वर सूरद जगदीश्वर इंद्र उवाच 
अहो दानव सिद्धोसी यस्यते मतिरिदृशी भक्त सर्वात्मनामानं सूरदं जगदीश्वरं इंद्र उवाच अहो दानव सिद्धोसी यस्य ते मतिरिदृशी भक्त सर्वात्मनात्मानं सूरदं जगदीश्वरं वैष्णवीस इंद्र उवाच इंद्र सैड अहो हलो दानवा ओ डीमन सिद्ध असी यू आर नाउ परफेक्ट यस्य हूज ते योर मति कॉन्शियसनेस इदृशी सच एस दिस भक्ता अ ग्रेट डिवोटी सर्व आत्मना विदाउट डाइवर्जन आत्मनाम टू द सुपर सोल सूरदम द ग्रेटेस्ट फ्रेंड जगत ईश्वरम टू द सुप्रीम पर्सनैलिटी ऑफ गॉड हेड ट्रांसलेशन एंड परपोर्ट बाय हिज डिवाइन ग्रेस ए सी भक्तिवेदांत स्वामी श्रीला प्रभुपाद Translation Indra said O great demon I see by your discrimination and endurance in devotional service despite your dangerous position that you are a perfect devotee of the supreme personality of godhead the super soul and friend of everyone please repeat the translation Indra said O great demon I see by your discrimination and endurance in devotional service despite your dangerous position that you are a perfect devotee of the supreme personality of godhead the super soul and friend of everyone 
purport. As stated in Bhagavad Gita 6.22, Yam labdhva chaparam labham manyate nadhikam tataha yasmin sthito na dukhena guru napi vichalyate. Established in Krishna consciousness, one never departs from the truth. And upon gaining this, he thinks there is no greater gain. Being situated in such a position, one is never shaken, even in the midst of the greatest difficulty. An unalloyed devotee is never disturbed by any kind of tiring circumstance. Indra was surprised to see that Vritrasura, undisturbed, was fixed in devotional service to the Lord. For such a mentality is impossible for a demon. However, by the grace of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, anyone can become an exalted devotee. Sriya Vaishyas Tatha Shudras Tepi Yanti Param Gatim. An unalloyed devotee is sure to return home back to Godhead. Om Ajnana Timirandhasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhishtam Sthapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadahamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Mukam Karoti Vachalam Pangum Langayate Girim Yat Kripa Tamaham Vande Shri Guru Dinatarinam Vancha Kalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhyayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna so we are continuing the discussion on the chapter entitled Vritrasura's Glorious Death. So this pastime has been going on since a few chapters. And today we are seeing the transition happening. So all these days we were hearing the instructions of Vritrasura to Indra. So the situation is very similar to Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna and Arjuna are on the battlefield and Krishna is instructing Arjuna about the tenets of the philosophy of Bhagavad Gita in front of a whole army. So here also Vritrasura and Indra are actually on the battlefield. They have, they have come down to fight. Vritrasura's birth itself was to actually defeat Indra. So they are fighting, they are on the battlefield and we see a similar situation. Vritrasura is actually giving philosophical instructions to Indra on the battlefield. And very similar, like we see Arjuna had given up his weapons. Arjuna had become bewildered when he saw so many of his own family members standing in the battlefield. So he had become very despondent and he had given up his weapons and he told uh, Krishna, I cannot fight. And that time then Krishna started speaking the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna, encouraging him to do his duty. And obviously there's so many other instructions um, Krishna gives. But we see very, very similar theme over here that Vritrasura is also doing the same thing with Indra. In the previous few verses, we saw that uh, Vritrasura being the great demon and fighter that he was, he was very easily able to overwhelm Indra in the fight. In fact, Indra's thunderbolt had actually fallen to the ground because of Indra, Vritrasura uh, flinging his mace at Indra's thunderbolt. And Indra had become very um, disappointed and sad because we have to remember Indra's position. He's actually the king of all the demigods. He's a, great, he's a great warrior himself. And he knows like others are also watching, other demigods are watching him and a demon could easily defeat him. So he becomes very disappointed in himself and with the way the fight was going and he actually doesn't even make endeavors to pick up the weapon, his thunderbolt back. And that time Vritrasura is encouraging. Now at least you know in the battlefield of Kurukshetra, Krishna was Arjuna's charioteer and they were on the same side. But this is almost like Duryodhana is encouraging Arjuna, don't give up your weapon, pick up and fight with me. It's almost like that because Vritrasura and Indra are on the opposite sides. One of them has to die on that battlefield. 
and Vritrasura is taking that position. When actually Indra gave up his weapon, he could have easily overpowered Indra and maybe killed him. But he's encouraging Indra that, no, you do your duty, you pick up your weapon and fight. Don't become so despondent. Don't become so disappointed or disheartened just because of one setback in life. Just pick up, let's continue this fighting. And he gives so many philosophical, nice philosophical instructions. So after he has finished speaking, yesterday we saw such a nice class by Sri Krishna Prabhu, where you know he was giving straightforward instructions and he was telling Indra, we are just like the pieces on a chessboard. And you know, our lives are at stake over here. And then he says that, um, it's in the next verse said that Indra was so touched by the straightforward instructions of Ritrasura. And now from this verse, we will see Indra start speaking. So the first time in this battle, Indra is now speaking. And what are the first words which are coming out of Indra's mouth? Nothing but appreciation and glorification for Vritrasura. Because it says, no, it takes one to recognize one. So we might see Indra's name coming up again and again in the Bhagavatam in a bad light, so to say. That, you know, Indra is, obviously we know the demigods are Kama Mishra Bhaktas. They are full of material desires, but whatever it is, they are devotees of the Lord. They are empowered representatives of the Lord. And... Therefore, the Lord trusts them with these main activities. Like, you know, in an organization, if a CEO is running a company, he will entrust, yeah, like the departments, or he will make his senior leadership team to head various departments in the organization, only people whom he trusts and who knows are capable. So in the same way, it is not that Krishna has made anybody the, you know, in charge of the universal affairs different different uh, departments of universal affairs obviously he trusts these demigods are law a lot he knows they are you know they they are trustworthy he knows they are whatever it is they are his devotees so therefore he has entrusted them with these affairs of the material universe and we know that indra whatever it is he is a devotee of the lord so he could recognize the glorious qualities of ritrasura and that is what we see him praising over here in this particular verse. He is saying that, O oh great demon, I see by your discrimination and endurance in devotional service. There are two adjectives he is using for Vritrasura. Your discrimination, the power to understand what is uh, Shreyas and what is prayers, and your endurance, endurance or tolerance or the persistence to go on despite setbacks in devotional service and despite your dangerous position. Now who could be more in a dangerous position than someone who's facing death in the face? Indra, Indra is standing there as death personified actually for Vritrasura. But still he is not giving up his Krishna consciousness. His instructions to Vritrasura were also fully about how to be surrendered to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And that is what Indra is praising, that despite your dangerous position, your endurance and discrimination in devotional service are still intact. And that is why you are a perfect devotee of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He uses the word, he says, Siddho Asi, you are now perfect in devotional service. So that word is very important over here. So we see Siddha means perfection, somebody who is aiming to achieve perfection. And this Siddha is, you know, everybody's goal in life. In whatever activities we do, we all want perfection in that activity. If we are in, whether it is material life, spiritual life, or any activities. In our office, for example, whoever's working, they want to, you know, do a good job so that they can keep getting that uh, money for their uh, livelihood. In the same way in our spiritual life, any spiritual activity we do, if someone's a singer, they want to sing to the best of their ability for the pleasure of the Lord. Like we see so many Matajis making nice jewelry for the Lord. So we see they are trying to do their best to please the Supreme Lord, to please the deities. If there are pujaris, they try to do their best in their, you know, the puja that they do, the arti, they do the dressing that they do of the deities. So everybody is trying to achieve perfection in material and spiritual realm. But it is very important that how that, where that perfection, the goal of that perfection is leading to. And whether one has the discrimination to realize where they have to actually put their efforts to achieve perfection and where they should not be putting their efforts to achieve perfection. Now in this regard, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur gives a very nice instructive story. He talks about the story of a boatman. So this was not even exactly a boatman, he was the assistant of a boatman. 
so his job was to actually when the boats come back you know ferrying passengers or from their fishing trips or whatever once the boats come back his job was to actually pull the boat with you know those huge ropes which are attached to boats to pull the ropes uh, to pull the boats were using those ropes and to anchor them on the shore and he used to do the day in day out that was his role and while bringing the boat on the shore he had to actually tread on many pointed stones the ground was uneven where the bank was where he used to work so he had to tread on all these uh, pointed stones and bring the boat and obviously those ropes are heavy these are huge boats we are talking about so he had to pull those ropes it was lot of effort hard work for him and while doing that sometimes he would get great pain in his feet because the surface was you know very slippery very you know some places had these stones and thorns and pebbles and all that so it 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 was it was a back breaking exercise it was a painful exercise to rope these boats in every day so once somebody asked him that if your aspirations are fulfilled if if you get you know some uh, wish fulfilling you know that genie you know how that aladdin and the lamp like that if you get some wish fulfilling lamp what will you wish for and that man said oh he thought for a moment and he said oh if i get such a wish fulfilling genie who can actually fulfill my aspirations i will actually tell him to arrange for huge big big soft pillows for me and he said oh what will you do with the pillows he said so that i can put them on the ground and i can walk on those pillows when i'm actually roping the boats in and so that the stones don't hurt my feet and then bhakti siddhanta saraswati thakur was saying that he's been given a, a a chance to fulfill his aspiration what is it that he could have asked for at least he could have asked for let me become the owner of all these boats so that i can employ somebody else to do this role but instead of that he is just asking for huge soft pillows so that he can tread on them and his feet don't hurt so much on the stones and the pebbles and thorns very similar to the other example which we have heard heard many times there was a lady who was carrying a big she was an elderly lady who was carrying a big bundle of sticks on her head and while and that was her job daily to cut wood in the forest make a bundle of all those sticks take them to the like put the put them on her head take them to the village and sell and that was that is how she used to earn her livelihood so when she and when she was going the rope with which she had tied her bundle was not very tight and her sticks fell down and then the supreme lord appeared over there and the supreme lord said what do you want my lady you've been toiling day and night so hard i'll fulfill your wish what is your desire and the lady said can you please tie these sticks back properly and put them on my head so that i can carry them comfortably back to the village and sell them so you see it is very difficult for some and that is why indra is praising the discrimination of ritrasura so where is the discrimination in this boatman and this old lady now the old lady supreme lord has appeared the old lady could have said take me back home back to godhead but the only thing she is asking for is put the sticks back on my head put the burden back so i can carry that burden <laughs> and you know keep living my daily humdrum life so that is what is being praised by indra over here that you have developed the desire discrimination and endurance in devotional service and therefore you are a perfect you are siddhasi you know what is perfection and which perfection to aim for not these limited perfections which will help you just do your job better like the boatman and the old lady but he is aiming for the highest perfection he is not where you know when one of his arms of ritrasura is cut off in this battle and that time ritrasura is not praising oh lord put my arm back so that i can fight better he is not he, he, never once we see ritrasura pray, praying like that his second arm was cut off by indra after, and that to ritrasura only inspired indra pick your weapon up and fight with me in that time his second arm is also cut off by indra but we again don't see him crying out in distress oh lord how are you dealing with me give me my arms back we never see such a prayer coming out of ritrasura's mouth at all so we see that you know these aspirations even devotees have these aspirations we are talking about what aspirations you know what sort of aspirations devotees have and where the discrimination is required in the desires that somebody does but the aspirations of a devotee and the actions have to match that is very important so we see ritrasura's aspiration his his goal is one pointed ekeha kuru nandana his goal is one pointed he is not deviating at all even though he is going through so many like a fierce battle with indra setback of his arms getting cut off but he is not losing sight of his goal 
So his aspiration is to achieve the lotus feet of Lord Sankarsana and his actions are matching with his aspiration. When some calamity is coming, when his arm is getting cut off, he is not deviating one bit from that aspiration. So with devotees, like, you know, that is a lesson we learn from this pastime, that our aspirations and actions have to be in alignment. That is very important. So sometimes, you know, and ISKCON especially, we are very, um, we have become very good at speaking out our aspiration. Oh, we want to go back home, back to Golok Vrindavan. Like any time you ask, especially in ISKCON devotee, what is your goal? Krishna, I want to go back to the lotus feet of Krishna in Golok Vrindavan. In fact, sometimes we even look down upon Vaikuntha. Nay, nay, hamara goal to Golok Vrindavan hai. Vaikuntha to, you know, it's like something which we don't even want to aspire for. Not realizing that even Vaikuntha is a great destination and very difficult to achieve. So if we see our aspiration is like that, but sometimes our activities do not match our aspiration. We keep saying, yes, we want to, the goal, is, the goal of this life is to go back to Krishna. The goal of this life to, is to go and serve uh, Shyam Sundar in um, Golok Vrindavan. We say all these things, but our activities are not aligned. And therefore, there, there is a test which Vritrasura has been put through, which he has passed so nicely, is that whether in any situation we can still retain these high aspirations and act according to them. So if our high, obviously, going back to Golok Vrindavan is the highest aspiration a devotee can have. And that is what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to give us. He came to give us that Madhurya Ras. He came to give us that love which is there. And the mood of Radharani, he came down to give us a taste of that love which everyone can develop for Krishna. So he came to give us the highest goal of life and the highest destination of life. But if our activities are not aligned, then we have failed the test. And many times we will see, we will be put through these activities. So a Siddha is one whose activities are aligned, his perfect perfectionist, and he won't change in any test of life. So, no, you know, not that people speak big, big things, but they are not walking their talk. And there are three tests of this, you know, act, you, this, this aspiration and activities being aligned. So the first test is that a Siddha, one who's aspiring to become a perfect, perfect devotee, he doesn't give up his goal even if someone offers him an easier alternative. He, he doesn't lose sight of his goal. And I was just thinking about this point and I was thinking that we have such nice examples in our own movement. So we know, you know, His Holiness Giriraj Maharaj or even His Holiness Jaipataka Swami Maharaj. So they were, you know, they, were, they came from very rich families. They were, they were sons of millionaires. And I, you know, Giriraj Maharaj's life story is there that he had joined the Krishna consciousness movement. He was very young at that time. And I think his father had offered him a huge heritage. He said that you come back to the family and I will give you this one million dollar check. You just have to come back to the family. Just give up all this, you know, new cult-like movement which you have joined, according to his father, and come back to the family and come back to the family business. But Giriraj Maharaj rejected that. He did not accept. He said, no, it's okay. I don't want any family inheritance. I have decided to dedicate my life to Srila Prabhupada. And with same with Jaipataka Maharaj. He also came from such a rich family and such an aristocratic upbringing, but he also did not give it up. You know, from pressure from his family and all that, he did not give it, give it up. And we see, therefore, they do not give up their goal, even if they were given an easier alternative. They were very set on the goal. They knew Krishna consciousness is the perfection of life. It's not all this money and all which are temporary things which are there in life. And the second test we see of a Siddha who is aspiring for perfection is that even if he faces danger or difficulties, he's completely fixed. And it, it might be physical dangers and difficulties. But he's absolutely fixed on his goal. He does not give up. Aspiring for Krishna consciousness. And sometimes we see someone whose faith is not very steady. That person, as soon as they are brought into some difficulty or they face some untoward situation, their faith gets shaken and they leave Krishna Bhakti. They say, what was the point of, you know, do, doing Krishna Bhakti? Krishna did not look after me. See the situation he has put me in. And they give up Krishna consciousness thinking that it is Krishna's fault that they are in this situation. They blame Lord Krishna 
for their situation and they give they give their they give they give their bhakti up the the process of devotional service and the association of devotees they give up but that is the second test of someone who has whose aspirations and activities are matching that even if they are in a dangerous situation they actually do not give up the goal of krishna consciousness and i was listening to a class and there was a very nice question which someone had asked so you know when a person is in a difficult situation now we see vritrasura is a highly elevated devotee even when his arms are being cut off even when indra is actually um, killing him it will come in the further verses that ultimately indra actually cuts off his head and just you know cutting off this head with the powerful thunderbolt of indra it takes one year for the head to get cut off because vritrasura was such a huge demon 365 days it's described in the bhagavatam for that whole thunderbolt to go through and chop off his head so you can imagine what pain it must have been just for that you know thunderbolt is cutting and cutting and cutting at least you know if in one jhatka we say if in one stroke it's cut off it won't be so painful but it's slowly cutting the head off so you can imagine the pain that he was going through but still he was completely he was completely in samadhi thinking of the supreme personality of godhead so our devotee asked a question that we see sometimes is it is it um, contrary to devotional service to seek krishna shelter when someone is in danger and we see many examples of this they are in the bhagavatam of exalted devotees we see the example of gajendra when he was in a dangerous position he actually cried out to krishna he actually picked up that lotus and he offered he remembered his the prayers from his previous lifetime and he actually sang beautiful prayers to uh, actually invoke the blessings and the mercy of krishna to save him from that dangerous position that he was in where he was being eaten by the crocodile so gajendra's example is there we have the example of draupadi when draupadi was in a dangerous situation she actually called out to krishna for help and she asked him to come and protect her chastity because for a woman you know the taking away of her chastity is worse than death so she was also in the most dangerous situation which a woman can be and she also cries out to krishna so you know the uh, uh, question that was asked was is it contrary to devotional service when you cry out to krishna for help when you are in a difficult or dangerous situation and the answer was no these devotees it is a it is it is not contrary because a devotee always tries to preserve his body so that he can continue his devotional service to krishna and we see the vrajvasis doing that when the vrajvasis are in danger they are always saying krishna krishna mahabaho they are running to krishna when the samvartaka clouds were pouring rain on vrindavan indra again indra is doing over there so indra the hero comes up in all these situations he was doing this and the vrajvasis actually run to krishna when they see any demons coming the vrajvasis the cowherd boys gopis uh, you know everybody runs to krishna for shelter so it is not contrary to devotional service when we seek to preserve our body so that we can continue serving krishna in fact you know in a bhakti shastri class we were doing the seventh chapter of bhagavad gita few weeks ago and there krishna says there are four types of people who surrender to him artho ardharti jigyasu and gyani so he says they are all exalted devotees and they are all very dear to me because at least they are surrendering to krishna at least they are not going to anybody else they are not taking shelter of any other they are not taking shelter of um, their own money their own wealth their own security guards or their own power or something like that they are coming to krishna for shelter so krishna says i like all of them but obviously he says he likes the gyani the best because he has absolutely no other desire except to you know through gyana or through study of the shastra he is not going there to krishna with some purpose in mind so we see that is the second test like if a devotee is put in difficult situation is he still keeping his faith in krishna or is he devi- deviating from the path and the third test is that he never deviates from the truth and he doesn't move one inch from his aspiration so sometimes you know in material life especially we see and people do that karma kandi people especially fruitive workers they do that so somebody says oh this calamity has come in your life let's say somebody is wants wealth they are in too much poverty or if somebody wants some um, good health 
because their health is not very good or something like that and somebody says oh if you worship this particular devata or you do this particular puja or yagya in 80 days your problem will be cured there are so many such you know solutionists in india who offer these short term solutions to people who are going through some problems and that that same person goes to somebody else comes and gives him advice and he says oh 80 days is too much i know of one person who can actually solve this problem in 40 days so you go to him so that person says oh okay 40 days so he gives up this 80 days uh, solutionist and goes to somebody else and then somebody says 40 days is too much this baba ji cured my problem in 12 days so then he'll give up and go to that 12 days baba ji so you see people just keep deviating wherever they are able to see an easier alternative they keep going there it's not that they are loyalists no no that 80 days baba ji i'm loyal to him i'm only going to stick to him let it take 80 days no problem no people deviate easily as soon as they find some alternative they deviate easily but the test of the discrimination of a devotee is he completely not even moves an inch from his goal he knows the goal is krishna bhakti he will not go to any easier alternatives let me do some demigod worship for the you know satisfaction of this particular desire or that desire or this difficulty has come i can't do krishna bhakti this is too much to do 16 rounds who gave me this you know mala around my neck to chant 16 rounds it's so difficult so they don't give up they don't deviate even one inch and they keep and you know by not deviating an inch obviously they have to go through the path which is full of difficulties they have to endure and that is the second quality which uh, indra is praising about vritrasura his endurance his persistence to keep carrying on with his bhakti despite any dangerous positions that he has been in and we see some examples from the scriptures such beautiful examples are there we know the example of kolavecha shridhar he was in extreme poverty we know the example of haridas thakur extreme hardships we know the example of pralad maharaj extreme astro- atrocities but all of these examples are there of you know the highest level of atrocities which for example pralad maharaj his own that too at the hands of his own father what worse situation can you be in your own protector has become your perpetrator his father is only actually doing all these atrocities on him putting him in boiling oil fire putting him on fire in the lap of his sister uh, throwing him down a cliff putting him in a pit of pit of snakes so many atrocities on pralad maharaj and then we see the example of haridas thakur beaten in 22 marketplaces and still he was continuously praying to krishna and saying please pardon these people please pardon these people who are beating me extreme tolerance and then we see the example of kolavecha shridhar in chaitanya charitramrita he had extreme poverty there was nothing left thatched roof water used to keep leaking but still his you know goal was to just attain you know love of krishna not deviating all these devotees never deviated from their goal and even an inch and that is the test of endurance which again we see vritrasura also demonstrating this highest endurance and discrimination he was not giving up his goal despite any um, setbacks he was not giving up his goal and taking up any easier alternatives and he was ready to endure and not settle down for anything else and not moving an inch from his goal so these are some tests which devotees go through and when we read of ritrasura we completely can relate to the verse which prabhupad quotes a lot in uh, his lectures and throughout the shrimad bhagavatam and that is from the 10th canto from brahma's prayers to lord krishna when you know brahma after the brahma vimohan leela he has come down to offer prayers to lord krishna and this is a famous verse which prabhupad quotes tatte nu kampam susumikshamano bhunjano evatma kritam vipakam radvak vipubhir vidadham namaste jeeva toye mukti sadaya bhak so the translation of this verse is very beautiful it says my dear lord one who earnestly awaits for you to bestow your causeless mercy upon him all the while patiently suffering the reactions of his past misdeeds and offering you respectful obeisances with his heart words and body is surely eligible for liberation for it has become his rightful claim so see your causeless mercy on upon him all the while patiently suffering the reactions of his past misdeeds and still continues to offer you respectful obeisances so for such a person mukti 
Your achieving your lotus feet has become his rightful claim. And Prabhupada very beautifully explains in the purport. Prabhupada says that for a son of a millionaire to become the rightful um, heir of the millions of dollars that his uh, father will leave him, he just has to be born as the son and stay a good son. That's it. So the father doesn't cut him off. So he just has to stay a good son and his, he will automatically inherit the father's uh, money. So in the same way, Prabhupada says that the devotee has to just stay on the path of devotional service, keep endeavoring with sincerity and achieving the lotus feet of Krishna is actually becomes his rightful claim. Krishna will definitely bestow upon him the lotus feet of uh, the shelter of his lotus feet. And very beautifully, Prabhupada talks about what a suffering devotee has to go through. Like we were saying, you no, know, that uh, second test is even though there are difficulties and uh, setbacks, a devotee does not give up. So Prabhupada says that the word susukshmi su samikshmanam indicates that a devotee earnestly awaits the mercy of the Lord, even while suffering painful effects of previous sinful activities. Now, Lord Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. That a devotee who fully surrenders unto him is no longer liable to suffer the reactions of his previous karma. Many times we hear this question that, you know, devotees ask that as soon as you take shelter, especially when you take initiation, you do not suffer the reactions of your previous karma. Your guru takes the karma away. Then what is it that we see devotees suffering? So Prabhupada says that um, a devotee in his mind may still maintain the remnants of his previous sinful mentality, not the reactions of his karma. And the Lord removes the last vestiges of the enjoying spirit by giving his devotee punishments that may sometimes resemble sinful reactions. That is what Prabhupada is explaining in the purport. That sometimes the Lord might give punishments which are just to remove these last vestiges of enjoyment that might be there in the devotee's mind because of his previous sinful mentality, which might be coming from the conditioned life that he lived before he became a devotee or from his previous lifetime. There might be some remnants there. So Krishna wants to completely remove them. And therefore he might be giving some punishment or suffering to that devotee so that he gives up that mentality as well. And he wants that enjoying spirit to be completely eradicated from a devotee's heart and therefore Krishna puts him through these difficulties. You know, sometimes we say Krishna fulfills a desire in some, you know, devotees have desires and Krishna is so merciful. So he fulfills those desires of a devotee, but he fulfills them in such a way that a devotee will never desire that thing again. Becomes bus bus Krishna, I'll never desire for this again. The way in which Krishna fulfills that desire. And for some devotees, he will not even full do that. He will put the devotee through suffering or he will put the devotee through so-called punishment just so that that whole mentality of that devotee is completely, like, you know, purified. And Prabhupada says that to achieve the pure, supreme pure Krishna's lotus feet, one has to go through this purificatory process of going through these, you know, uh, difficulties or these um, so-called punishment that the Lord might give. That is how Prabhupada says in this purport. So a devotee keeps going through this. For him, the goal, the process of devotional service is his life and the goal is also that he continues the process of devotional service. And in this regard, there is a very beautiful uh, story which we have heard many times. But there was a sadhu who was going on the way with his disciples and um, he meets different, different people on his way. So he first meets actually a prince who was coming, who was, the, who was the son of a king. And he was coming that way and the sadhu, he seeks blessings because, you know, India's little bit culture was there in the previous days. So the uh, prince uh, immediately comes and seeks blessings from the sadhu. And he says, give me your blessings, oh uh, dear guru. And the sadhu says that, oh, you are the son of a prince. He says, Chiranjiva. May you live forever. And then he goes on. And then he meets a brahmachari. This brahmachari was the disciple of a spiritual master. And he also comes and pays obeisances and asks blessings from this sadhu. So the brahmachari, when he seeks these blessings, the sadhu tells him that ma jiva, uh, uh, ma jiva muni putraka. So the meaning is, may you die immediately to this brahmachari. 
and then the sa sadhu keeps going ahead with his disciples and the third person he meets is a saintly person a sadhu himself the sadhu meets another sadhu a saintly person and to this sadhu he gives the benediction jivo ma varo va sadhu so may you neither either die or either live it's the same for you and then he goes ahead and he meets a butcher on the way and the butcher also somehow comes and seeks blessings and for the butcher he says ma jiva ma maroin so he says uh, you know whether you die live or whether you die it's the same so the, the disciples then get a bit bewildered and they come and ask they ask the, their guru for explanation and they ask him you gave different different blessings to all these different people but we did not understand why you discriminated in giving these blessings and then they are, uh, this sadhu explains he said to the prince i said chiram jiva that means may you live forever because this prince has so much opulence right now in his life he is enjoying the kingdom he is enjoying so much wealth power good beauty health physique everything but in his next lifetime he is going to suffer so that is why i told him chiram jiva that may you continue to live and enjoy in this lifetime because next lifetime is suffering for you for the brahmachari i said ma jiva muni putra ka so i told him that because the brahmachari is doing so many austerities he is really serving his spiritual master well he is living a very simple and austere life and for him i said may you die immediately because he is living an austere life that will come to an end first of all and because he has led such an austere life for him going back to godhead is assured so that is why i gave him that blessing that may this life go come to an end so that you get liberation and you you can get rid of these austerities that you are doing and achieve the goal that you wanted to achieve and to the sadhu he said jivo ma va maro va so to the sadhu he gave that special blessing jivo va maro va means may you you know it doesn't matter whether you die or you live because in this lifetime you are serving the lord you are engaged in the process of devotional service and may you continue to be engaged in the process of devotional service even after this lifetime is over so it doesn't matter whether you live or whether you die and to the butcher he gave that particular blessing because he said the butcher is living such a sinful life so whether he lives this life or whether he goes to the next life his life because he is going to suffer the sinful reactions of this life his life is going to be hellish even in the next life so right now he is killing animals obviously a butcher's life is you know all the time killing animals in the midst of blood and all that so right now he is living a hellish condition of life and in the next life definitely hellish conditions are awaiting him and that is why i gave that, that particular blessing to the butcher so for a devotee that blessing is very important jivo va maro va because we say you know what what is the sadhana that we do the sadhana that we do is chanting the hari krishna maha mantra and serving the deities serving the devotees association of devotees doing going the process of devotional service and what is our goal our goal is also to continue this sadhana to continue chanting hari krishna maha mantra to continue serving the lord in whichever destination the lord might give us so you know if you ask you know in melbourne temple for example the deities are non different from krishna prabhupad said melbourne temple is non different from vrindavan so whether you know we live here or we go back to golok vrindavan for us the service is the same for us it is you know it doesn't matter to us whether we continue serving in you know krishna's the deity form here in melbourne temple or you know we actually go and serve krishna in some other planet so that is why this jivo marova blessing is very important and i was thinking because we are discussing you know the chapter's title is vritrasura's glorious death and we are discussing this jivo marova concept i was thinking we'll discuss a little bit about some glorious people who came in iskon who had such you know uh, who led exemplary lives and they were exemplary in their death as well just as vritrasura has been so exemplary in his death they have also have been exemplary in their death and obviously the may best example for all of us is shri la prabhupad he set such a good example for us when he was leaving his body obviously he led his whole life in krishna consciousness we know from the leelamrita so many past times but even when he was leaving his body if we see there are there is a video about prabhupad leaving his body and it is so touching he is only skin and bones during his last days and devotees had to physically help him even to turn to his side and even during that time we see the dictaphone is next to his mouth and he is translating the purports of shrimad bhagavatam 
In fact, the Brahma Bhima and Leela was one of the last Leelas that Srila Prabhupada translated before he left this world. And he told also that I, am, I want to set an example for all my disciples on how to leave this world. I want to be a warrior who's fighting till his last breath for his country, just as a warrior fights for his country till his last breath. In the same way, I want to be a warrior in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's spiritual army. Continue to fight till my last breath, till I have delivered the last soul that I can to the lotus feet of Krishna. So Srila Prabhupada showed us through his example, but I was also reading um, the uh, book by Giri Raj Maharaj called Many Moons. And there are so many nice examples over there of devotees who have departed this world in a glorious way. And one nice example which I was, you know, meditating on was His, his um, Divine Grace, uh, His, uh, his uh, Holiness, Sridhar Maharaj. So Sridhar Maharaj was a very dear disciple of Srila Prabhupada. And he was, he was originally from Canada. So he was a Canadian uh, monk when he joined the Krishna Consciousness Movement. And everybody used to call him a Jolly Guru, the Canadian Jolly Guru. Because all the time Sridhar Maharaj would be cracking jokes, very, very jovial personality. And I was reading Giriraj Maharaj reminisces about Sridhar Maharaj. He had very close association of Sridhar Maharaj. So he reminisces about Sridhar Maharaj. And he says that Sridhar Maharaj was actually diagnosed with hepatitis C. And he also got diagnosed with liver cirrhosis. This was a few years before he passed away. So he was diagnosed with this and liver cirrhosis is a disease where the liver stops functioning slowly. And the function of the liver we know is mainly to get rid of toxins of the body. So for him it was a very painful situation because the liver could not get rid of the toxins very easily and those toxins would sometimes go in his brain and they would put him in a, you know, a, a coma for some, some maybe one or two days or a few hours and then slowly the body will process the fluids back out of the brain and he would come back to consciousness. So even though he knew this, he was continuously traveling. He, in fact, intensified his traveling when he came to know he had, he had this condition. And, you know, during this traveling also, he would continuously preach to different, different devotees and make, still continue to make disciples. So he had a very dear servant called Maya Purdas, who writes a lot about his uh, whole uh, his life history and the way he passed away, the glorious departure of Sridhar Maharaj in the same book. Giriraj Maharaj quotes Maya Purdas as well. So he said that Mayapurda says that uh, Sridhar Maharaj was going to a healer in Brazil to get some treatment done. You know how there are some healers who have some powers. You know, it comes down through parampara sometimes for these healers. They have learned this art of healing through their guru, their guru, their guru, like that. So this healer in Brazil had some powers through which he was able to see through the subtle body and therefore he was able to see what is the problem. For him, it was like an x-ray machine. He could stay, see inside what is the problem and he could then actually give some healing powers to that person. So Sridhar Maharaj would go to visit him. And it is said that this healer was very fond of Sridhar Maharaj because he knew Sridhar Maharaj is actually a spiritualist. And he would actually make Sridhar Maharaj just sit there and chant while he was looking at other patients. Because he said that you are, you know, you are bringing that spiritual aura with you. It will help me in my healing of other patients. So like that he used to, you know, he had so much respect for Sridhar Maharaj. So once Sridhar Maharaj had gone to him, now again speaking of Sridhar Maharaj's jolly nature, he had gone to him and this uh, healer was, um, he in fact on that time occasion he called all his assistants. He had lots of assistants who used to help him, you know, give the medications to people and whatever diagnosis uh, the healer would give, they would write that down and uh, generally they would assist him in giving out all his healing medications to people. So he gathered all his uh, assistants and he wanted to demonstrate to them something. So he, what he did was he made Sridhar Maharaj sit and he put a towel on his head. And then he sort of went in a trance and he wanted Sridhar Maharaj also to follow suit, to go in sort of a trance and then he kept asking Sridhar Maharaj. He said that now you tell us what you were in your previous life. So like you know in that deep meditative tone trying to you know he himself is in a trance and he wanted to show something to his disciples, his you know fellow healers. And he kept asking Sridhar Maharaj and Sridhar Maharaj was 
Sridhar Maharaj was not falling in line, aligning with what this uh, healer was trying to do. So he kept asking him, now you tell us what you were in your previous life. We want to know what, what you went through in your previous life. And then, you know, Sridhar Maharaj ultimately got frustrated and he said, I was a worm in stool in my previous life. So even though he's going through so much pain, Sridhar Maharaj was never losing his jovial side. So, and you know, at that time the healer became so disappointed that he didn't get the answer, the exotic answer that he was looking for from this, from this, uh, per, this patient. So then, you know, he let go of him and he healers also he sent away. And Sridhar Maharaj realized that he was actually demonstrating something through me. So he, he had such a nice human nature. He went and told this healer, I'm sorry you were trying to show something, but somehow I was not able to experience what you were trying to show me. But I know I was a worm in stool because I had such a degraded life and my spiritual master has somehow saved me from that degraded position. And he has actually, you know, given me this process which will help me go back to Krishna. On another occasion, like, you know, once his disease kept progressing, he was then later on, towards the later stages of his life, he actually developed liver cancer. So during that time, you know, he decided, he tried a few things, he actually went to Canada to see if liver transplant can be done, but the cancer had spread, so even the doctors ruled out that we can't do that. And they had given him very few, few days or few months to leave, to live. So Sridhar Maharaj decided that I want to now go to Mayapur because he was very attached to Panchatattva. So he decided he wants to go to Mayapur and His Holiness Indra Dhyumna Maharaj actually accompanied him from London. So from Canada he took his flight to London and from London he came to Mayapur. So His Holiness Indra Dhyumna Maharaj very mercifully, Sridhar Maharaj's sister actually arranged that, that Indra Dhyumna Maharaj be with Sridhar Maharaj because he was extremely weak. And his body had become completely frail and he had no energy left in his body. Anytime he could go into coma because the liver was not processing the toxins out. So then Indra Dhyumna Maharaj accompanied Sridhar Maharaj. And that time, you know, Giriraj Maharaj would continuously be in touch with him. And uh, Sridhar Maharaj expressed to Giriraj Maharaj on the phone that he, has, he said, I have three, three desires before I leave this body. He said, the first desire is that I reach Mayapur alive. I don't die on the way. I want to reach my, enter Mayapur Dham at least. And he said, if once that desire is fulfilled, my second desire is I, that I live till the installation of the Panchatattva. And that I'm there, part of that ceremony, because he was so attached to Panchatattva, to Gauranitai. And my third desire is there, that I live till to see Gaur Purnima as well, in Mayapur. So then, you know, these three desires were there in his heart, and Indra Dhyumna Maharaj actually accompanied him. And it is, the, you know, the way Giriraj Maharaj describes in this book, it is so heart-touching that so many God-brothers of uh, Giri, uh, Sridhar Maharaj had come over there. So many Prabhupada's disciples had come and they had arranged a huge reception for Sridhar Maharaj when he entered Mayapur. And, you know, he came to, they wanted it to be a surprise, but little bit he came to know because um, Bhakti Charu Maharaj, who was helping to organize this whole uh, warm reception for Sridhar Maharaj, he kept calling Indra Dhyumna Maharaj, where have you all reached, where have you all reached. So Sridhar Maharaj realized they are doing something. And Sridhar Maharaj, it is described as so attached to his god brothers. He always used to say, you know, especially when he was diagnosed with all these, all these things, he used to always pray and say that my god brothers are more dear to me than my own life. And all I have is my dependence on them and I'm dependent on their mercy to make me remember Krishna during my time of death. Even his disciples, like, you know, Mayapur Das describes that one Sridhar Maharaj was sitting and one of his Grahastha God brothers was sitting with him. And Mayapur Das had come actually to garland Sridhar Maharaj and he had only one garland in his hand. So as he was coming closer, Sridhar Maharaj realized that he doesn't have two garlands. So he said, do you have a garland for my God brother? And Mayapurda says, no, Maharaj. He said, then go and bring them, and then only you come and garland both of us together. So always he would do that. Even in initiation ceremonies, if he would have his god brothers next to him, he would always tell his uh, disciples that you all take, pay obeisances to your, my god brothers first, and then you all come and pay obeisances to me. So much importance he used to give to his god brothers. So this Mayapurda was describing that when Sridhar Maharaj was being received in... Um, Mayapur, um, and before that in London, when Sridhar Maharaj reached, reached London and Indra Jumna Maharaj was with him, there were so many, because Maharaj had lots of disciples in Brazil, Slovenia, all these countries. 
So many of his disciples came to take darshan of their guru in London. Many disciples had assembled over there and it was a very, very heart-wrenching moment because those disciples knew they were seeing their spiritual master for the last time. He is going to leave his body in Mayapur and they might not have his physical presence ever again. So very, very emotional moments are there in that room where his disciples were taking darshan of Sridhar Maharaj. And that time Sridhar Maharaj decided, okay, I'm going to give second initiation to some of y'all who are, you know, waiting for second initiation. So in that room itself, he said, okay, y'all come, I will give y'all second initiation. But because sometimes this fluid would go, the toxins were not being flushed out by the liver, the fluid would go in his brain and it would make him delirious sometimes. So he would not know what he is speaking, sometimes that would happen. So he started giving the Gayatri Mantra to these uh, disciples and he forgot some of the words of the Gayatri Mantra. So he asked Indradyumna Maharaj, he said, okay, what comes after this? And then Indradyumna Maharaj would help him. So like that on a few occasions that happened, and then he told Indradyumna Maharaj, my brain is foggy, I'm not able to remember the words. Why don't you say word by word and I will repeat to my disciples so that they hear from my mouth, the Gayatri Mantra. And once that exercise was done, he gave the Gayatri Mantra to his um, disciples and gave them second initiation. And after that he was saying, he said this Gayatri Mantra and all that is fine. Okay, it allow, helps us to do dev uh, deity worship and all, but our main business is to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. And then he quoted three verses from the Bhagavatam. He quoted um, Hare Nama, Hare Nama, Hare Nama Eva Kevalam. That whole verse he quoted. He also quoted the verse where it says, you know, uh, how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came in this world. As Chait um, uh, Krishna came as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in this world to just give the holy name to everybody. So like that he quoted a few verses from the Bhagavatam glorifying the potency of the holy name. And then Indra Dhyamna Maharaj asked him, he said, Maharaj, few minutes ago, you were not able to say the words of the Gayatri Mantra. And now you are with verse number, you are quoting these verses from Bhagavatam so clearly. And then he said, he said that, yeah, because our main business is chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Gayatri Mantra is just a tool which will assist in the, us in the main business of chanting Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So Giriraj Maharaj describes that his consciousness was completely clear. So when he reached Mayapur, he received this whole uh, reception and he used to continuously play, pray to his god brothers, whoever was coming to seek his blessings and also obviously say goodbye to him before they left to go to whichever part of the world they were in. He kept praying to them that, oh Lord, please let me have clear consciousness when I leave this world. Because I don't want to leave this world in coma. Because like I said, some days he would go in coma and then the fluid would drain out from the brain and then he would come back to consciousness. So Mayapur Das describes that during his last time, like he was, he realized he's going to leave and his, you know, the fluid had accumulated in his abdomen. It has become huge because all the fluid had accumulated. And in a normal hospital, the doctors would actually keep draining the fluid. They would take six, seven liters out of that abdomen. So if you're in Mayapur also, like he had called all the devotees and he said, you'll start Kirtan for me. Please do soft Kirtan for me because I don't think much time is left. So all the devotees were doing kirtan and then one doctor had come to see him in Mayapur on his bed. And the doctor was very seriously like, you know, touching his uh, abdomen and seeing like how much fluid is there and whether we, how to drain it out. And he was assessing that situation. So he was continuously touching his abdomen here and there. And Sridhar Maharaj, everybody felt he's like, you know, not, not in external consciousness because of the pain. And while this doctor was touching, Sridhar Maharaj opened his eyes and said, it's a boy. So that is how he was. Even during such times, he was completely like, you know, joking, jovial, and he would tell devotees. He would say that oh, these setbacks will keep coming, but, you know, just be happy in Krishna consciousness. This, you know, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to give us such a process which, you know, was to make all the jivas happy in this otherwise miserable world. So don't become so bogged down by your problems that you are not able to laugh or smile. So that was his consciousness. And, you know, then the devotees did kirtan and it is said he kept clear consciousness till the last breath. They had kept a photo of Srila Prabhupada in front of him and looking at that photo, he left this world. And the devotees chanting continuously the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. And all his desires were fulfilled. He was part of the Panchatattva Abhishek. When the Panchatattva deities were installed, he was part of that Abhishek. And his god brothers had asked, which, which deity you want to bathe during the Abhishek? And he said, oh, I want to bathe Lord Nityananda. 
So he was behind Lord Nityananda and Mayapur Das describes, he said that he was so frail, he could not even walk, even to go to the bathroom, sometimes they had to, the, the servants had to assist him, to bring him from the bathroom back, take him to the bathroom and all, he had become so weak. But during, you know, because his consciousness was so absorbed in Krishna, on the day of the Abhishek, he was completely up and roaring like a lion. And to stand behind the deity, we know how tall, Panchatatvar, and just to stand behind that deity and, you know, each kalash which was made of silver, the kalash it itself uh, was 5-6 kilos and plus the liquid in that, whether it was water, milk, juices, whatever. So he said he would keep carrying that. Now you can imagine how heavy it would become. And he would keep doing the Abhishek of Lord Nityananda and he did that for one or one and a half hours continuously. So he was empowered, even during his last days, he was setting that example on how to not, you know, completely be still surrendered and not to let these setbacks of health and all that take you away from the process or the goal of devotional service. So I thought we'll share a little bit about him because he had such, he left in such a nice way. When we read Vritrasura, I thought, you know, reading, I had read this many moons book, there are beautiful pastimes of many other disciples of Prabhupada as well. But Sridhar Maharaj's example stood out because he left his you know, body very gloriously, knowing that death is coming, so much pain, but completely in consciousness of Krishna, like we see Vritra Sura over here. So we'll end the class here. Any comments, questions, or corrections? Oh, Hari will sit here. Sorry, a moment of association of pure devotees. Thank you, Sivya. Very nice questions you ask every day. So the question is, um, we know that a moment of association um, of a devotee can give us liberation. Huh? Uh, so why don't we see Indra's consciousness changing even though he was in association of Vritrasura? Um, so yes, a moment, you know, Lava Matra Sadhu Singha Sarva Siddhi Hoi, we know. So the, a moment of association of a pure devotee can open the doors for liberation. But whether we walk, choose to walk through those doors of liberation is the choice that free will is still not taken away from that uh, person who's associating with this uh, devotee. So whether we make the choice to walk through that door and actually accept the liberation opportunity that has been given to us, that is still in the hands of the person who's associating with the pure devotee. So we see Indra, in fact, had association of Lord Krishna himself, didn't he? When he actually poured the Samvartaka clouds, he came down to seek pardon from him but he still didn't go back to Godhead. So we have to understand two aspects over here. One is, like I said, somebody is taking the opportunity or no. We see like when Prabhupada was here on this planet, so many people associated with him, but not everyone took up the opportunity to have, you know, uh, Krishna consciousness and, you know, take up the process. So that is one thing, whether people choose to take, the, take up that opportunity, the moment the association of a sadhu opens the doors and creates the opportunities, but whether somebody grabs or no is still the free will. And it also depends on how much conditioning they have come with. But we also have to remember that the devotee's association and the process of Krishna consciousness will definitely bring some change. You know how grass is at three levels. There is wet grass, semi-dry grass and hay. So the fire, when you put fire to a wet grass, it is becoming dry but it might not catch fire immediately. It will require long time of drying before it catches fire. And then you put fire to semi-dry grass, that is, will also not catch fire immediately, but at least it will become hay. But if you put fire to hay, which is completely dry, what happens? It straight away like, you know, blazes into a huge fire. So everybody is at different levels. Some are that wet grass, but the fire is definitely drying it, no? So in the same way, the fire of association of devotees is definitely bringing their consciousness higher. And then, you know, if the, they are at that semi-wet grass, it is becoming hay. So some lifetime they will come in association of someone and it will be just like that fire which the hay caught. 
and they will quickly take up the process of Krishna consciousness. So in terms of Indra, we can see definitely there will be changes happening because of the association of these pure devotees. But right now we don't see that change because he is not availing of the opportunity. And the second thing we have to remember is, like I was saying, Indra has been given a position and he has to take care of this department of, you know, being the king of all the demigods and of the department of rain. So he still has to do that duty towards the Supreme Personality of Godhead in this lifetime and that is something which he has to still keep doing as an empowered representative of the Lord. So we have to see on the other side he is also still continuing to do his duty. But whether he do, does it with a change in consciousness or no, that is the opportunity which Indra sometimes misses to change his consciousness and we see him committing offences again and again. In further chapters, we will see when Prithu Maharaj is doing the yajna, he actually comes as a fake sannyasi to rob the horse of Prithu Maharaj. All those pastimes will come. So, some nuts are hard to crack. But Indra is still doing his uh, duty as well. So, there are both aspects. He's, you know, somebody takes the opportunity of association of devotees, which Indra is not taking so much, plus Indra is still has to continue his duty in this material world to Krishna. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Yes. So Arjuna also killed Bhishma Dev on the battlefield of Kurukshetra and Indra killed Vritrasura. So why did Indra get the sin but not Arjuna? That's your question. So um, what is the sin Indra, Vritra, Indra got for killing Vritrasura? Very nice, you read really well. So, um, we see that Arjuna was acting obviously on the orders of Lord Krishna. He was personally present over there. Now, we have to understand the difference between Arjuna and Indra. Why was Indra fighting and why was Arjuna fighting? See, it all depends on the intention and the motivation. So, Indra was fighting with Vritrasura because he wanted his kingdom back. He always, Indra is in fear that my kingdom will be taken away. So therefore he keeps putting obstacles on somebody who is even doing austerities. He thinks, oh, they are doing austerities to take my position or my kingdom away. So we see Indra keeps sending all these apsaras and all that to um, put, put obstruction on so many, you know, personalities who are doing austerities or meditation and all. Because his motivation is to protect his seat. So to say, like politicians are always fighting to protect their seat in politics like that. Indra's position is, all, his motivation, his intention is just to protect his, his particular position in this material world. Whereas Arjuna was actually not even wanting to fight, if you see. He gave up fighting, but, Indra, but Krishna told him, no, you fight, you do your duty. I have already killed these people. So Arjuna was fighting for the establishment of dharma. Whereas Indra was not fighting for the establishment of Dharma. Indra was fighting for the protection of his own kursi. Kursi or chair or throne. So that is the difference and therefore Indra had to suffer the reaction because he killed a pure devotee of the Lord. Whereas Arjuna doesn't have to because he was fighting a war to stage, the, um, to bring Dharma back in life. In the world. Does that answer? Also Priyavata also had the same problem in Indra. In Priyavata, he had to do one more second. Maharaj Prithu, you mean? Yeah, thank you, Prabhuji. Any other questions? Okay, we'll end the class here. Granthraj Srimad Bhagavatam ki, Srila Prabhupada ki, Jai Nitai Gaur Premanandev.